Today's lecture is dedicated to a very special class of natural dyes that is anthocyanin. And anthocyanins, let me tell you, have been the largest source of various colors. It is not that anthocyanins are only reds in color or blue, but they vary from red to orange to blues to violet. And this variety of range of color comes from the very fact that anthocyanin dyes can form uh, acidic uh, salts or basic salts and that is because of their beautiful structure. Let us try to look at this slide where you see that the A, B, C rings are connected and there is a sugar pendant hanging OGLC. Now, this OGLC represents the sugar moiety and this sugar could be glucose, galactose or ramnanose. It could be other sugars also, but predominantly these are the three sugars that are naturally present along with cyanid anthocyanin. And when these include the pendant sugar, the anthocyanidins are then called as anthocyanins. So, if now we try to look at this particular structure, there could be a possibility of R1, R2, R3 and apart from that, there could be R prime, R prime prime and so on. And you see the counting of the ring is done from the oxygen that is the heteroatom. So, if Z1 is the position of the oxygen in the uh, C ring, then it is count, uh, counted from clockwise 1, 2, 3, 4. So, it has a 3 substitution, it has a 5 substitution, it can have a 6 substitution, it can have a 7 substitution. And apart from that, it can have the substitution in the B ring, which could be 3 prime, 4 prime, 5 prime. Now, these R groups also can be methyl or hydroxy or uh, many other such functionalities, which make a huge variety of anthocyanin or anthocyanin dyes. So, looking at this structure, can these dyes be used for natural dyeing was a natural question and because they have such bright colors and as you may recall, there was a myth about uh, natural dyes that they are very dull and pastel and that is why they did not get popularized. That was primarily because the 6 or 7 dyes that were being used uh, from ancient times belong to either indigo dyes or flavonoid dyes or anthroquinone, anthroquinone dyes. But anthrocyanin dyes were not explored for the simple reason that people did not know how to use them, how to extract them, how to preserve the color, what is the pH sensitivity and so on and so forth. So, we did a lot of extensive work on uh, anthocyanin dyes and we showed that this particular dye which was partly used in food industry for some purposes can also be used for textile dyeing. And it is with this point in uh, mind that we designed this particular lecture based on the fact that this particular pigment can be a very good source of natural dye. So, if I have to talk about this uh, natural dyeing of uh, cotton with hibiscus uh, using uh, hibiscus as a source of anthocyanin. Hibiscus is a flower which is popularly seen everywhere, gudhal ka phool. And it is bright red in color. So, it is uh, it has a very bright attractive color and therefore, we thought and it is abundantly available. <coughs> One very important factor for natural dyeing is that the source should be renewable and the source should be abundantly available. 
and it is with that in mind that we designed this lecture number 26 based on the fact that it should now come to your knowledge that apart from indigoid dyes, anthraquinone dyes and flavonoid dyes, there is a major major class of dyes which is called anthocyanin or anthocyanidine dyes which have beautiful structural situation as what I showed you in the previous slide and because of the variation in the functionality in uh, and position of the functional group on the ABC ring, it is possible to have a variety of naturally occurring anthocyanin. So, the anthocyanins that were present in hibiscus flower, we will take a look of how was it kind of introduced to dyeing, how what are the procedural de uh, details of natural dyeing with hibiscus, is, are there any modification, how is it extracted and so on and so forth. Now, when we try to just look at an overview of dyes, we know that dyes could be a source from natural as well as synthetic and from the natural source we have to look for plant origin uh, dyes, mineral origin dyes or animal origin dyes. We have all studied this, but this is just like a recapitulation of natural dyeing because just a couple of lectures back we were doing some synthetic dyes. So, I am trying to give you an overview of synthetic dyes and their dyeing procedure. I am also trying to give you an overview of natural dyes, modern dyes and so on and so forth. And among the natural dyes, which, which are the dyes that are most variable? When we try to look at different classes of natural dyes, I was telling you that we had discussed mainly the indigo vat dyeing, we had discussed uh, uh, you know alizarine and many other anthraquinone dyes, but we had not got into the too much of details of the anthocyanin. So, I thought that we should spend one or two lectures just trying to understand because this is a huge class of natural dyes which can be functionalized or which can be used for natural dyeing. Different colors as what I said, they are acid base or pH sensitive. So, reds can be obtained, blues can be obtained, even violets can be obtained. If we keep this dye under the very acidic conditions say something like 5.5 uh, pH, then it would give red colors. If we keep it for 9, it will give something like um, you know uh, blues, but if they are kept neutral, some of them are even very dark violet colors. So, this is the kind of uh, phenomenal number of shades can be generated from the same dye. Now, when we try to look at different types of uh, dyes uh, and the natural pigments, you know the one major class of pigment as I mentioned is of course, uh, carotenoids. We will discuss that also in detail some other time. There is uh, the second class which is beta lane and the third one is the anthocyanin. It is this particular natural dye which we will be talking more and the dyeing procedure that needs to be followed in case of natural dyeing with anthocyanin. Now, when we try to you know look at various uh, situations with the anthocyanin, the information is that though these are color pigments that are found profusely in plant kingdom. So, this is probably one of the largest uh, occurring uh, natural dye in nature. The colors imparted by these pigments are blue, red, purple in flowers, stems, leaves, roots and of the plants. They are soluble in water, generally occur in aqueous cell sap. So, you see it has all the requisites of being a good dye. First thing is it is water soluble, it is abundantly available, it is brightly colored. Now, the question is does it adhere to the fabric? Because it has so many OH groups in the A, B, C ring, 
it is possible that it has a good chelation property as well. So, colors that can be obtained from anthocyanin could be ranging from red, purple and blue. See, when we were doing anthocyanoid dyes, we were only concentrating on the reds or the orange. When we were doing indigoid dyes, we were only concentrating on the blues. But here is a variety and that is the reason why I thought I should spend some time teaching you about the anthocyanin dyes. Sources could be red cabbage, strawberries, grape skin, blueberries, raspberries. You see, I mean you can think of any kind of color in nature, in the flowers, various varieties of flowers that have very brightly colored, uh, you know, uh, colors like red, blue and violet and you can uh, close your eyes and imagine that this has to be anthocyanin. Apart from anthocyanin, there could be associated dyes as well from, uh, from the carotenoid series or from the flavonoid series, but the major one will be anthocyanin. Color pigment is cyanidine, delphindine, malvidine, pyohinidine. These are some of the structures and the structural difference in cyanidine and malvidine or cyanidine and delphinidine or cyanidine in or peonidine is simply the R groups around the ABC ring. That is all the difference and that creates difference in the coloration. They are soluble in water and each pigment is stable, has its own different stability, bright in low pH, ranging range becomes blue at high pH and that is what I have mentioned that you know they have this uh, uniqueness of pH sensitivity. And some of these uh, anthocyanin dyes have been found to have antimicrobial properties, anti-cancer properties and of course, they are antioxidants. And that is why you know brightly colored fruits are recommended. We say do not eat green grapes, but uh, eat the purple grapes or the dark grapes that is because it has lot of an antioxidants. So, it has its own medicinal values as well as the dyeing properties are absolutely adaptable and apt for the or the prerequisite that is required for a dye to be a suitable dye is all found in the uh, this anthocyanin dyes. Now, this is the structure that I had initially shown you, but I wanted to correlate the structure and therefore, I was trying to uh, start the lecture with this particular uh, slide. Now, when this hydrolysis of the sugar is uh, done, that time it will be called as anthocyanidine. But when the sugar is also hanging as a pendant as in shown in the above uh, structure, you will see that it, uh, it is called anthocyanin. So, it is just the nomenclature, but nevertheless it is the composition of these uh, aromatic rings with uh, oxygen and the R groups being of OH or different types of functional groups which are very good adherent to the fabric and also help in metal chelation. Now, when we try to uh, look at uh, various types of mordanting, we now come to the natural dyeing procedure. We know that for natural dyes, it is important to have mordanting step done. Most natural dyes need both a plant extract and a mineral mordant to make a permanent color. The stronger the dye extract, the more plant used, the deeper will be the color. Mineral or the min mordant salts are always used in the same proportion that is varying from 1 to 4 percent. But keeping in mind that copper and chromium should be used as minimal as possible. Time, temperature, concentration are variables in involved in any chemical reaction. High temperature means less time needed for dyeing 
as doses of higher concentration of dye stuff will always make good dyeing. These are certain you know pre assumptions that can be uh, seen whether they are uh, valid for anthocyanin or not. But the popular mordants that are used we have discussed time and again that metal mordants are the ones which are used and here is a dye with appropriate appendages to attach to the metal salt. So, what happens the metal salt acts as a bridging head on one side is the dye and on the other side is the fabric. So, that is how it acts as a bridging head to connect the dye, the fabric and the mordant. So, we it is like a connecting device you can think in your mind. Therefore, now we come to the various possibilities of mordanting. We all know this and we are repeating this several times in case of natural dyeing because the, these possibilities are um, uh, only acceptable or valid for natural dyeing. We can either do a pre mordanting of the fabric or we can do simultaneously is simultaneous mordanting where dyeing and mordant are done simultaneously or we can have a meta mordanting step that is the post mordanting uh, step. So, meta mordanting is uh, equivalent to simultaneous mordanting I am sorry about that, but post mordanting is also possible. Now, when we try to look at the literature and we try to see whether people have actually used this or not because we were claiming that we were the first ones to popularize it. They, they in this literature review constitutes of more than you know 100 reviews which were published between 1868 to 2009 and it says that yes some people did try to use. Um, uh, modern uh, anthocyanin dyes with natural fibers, but somehow the stability of the anthocyanin uh, you know was not uh, established properly while dyeing with these and they used it in combination with some other natural dyes and many a times it was you know like misleading whether we can really use the uh, red anthocyanin from the cabbage. Uh, to change uh, the uh, or to use it because you know it is very pH sensitive. So, if suppose the dyeing is carried out at a different pH it will give different uh, uh, color and hue color makes a lot of difference. So, this kind of standardization was not available that was for sure. So, we start to explore into the details of standardization of the dye. We had spent one full lecture on the uh, effect of standardization. See, if we do not standardize these new newly screened dyes, then one cannot establish or cannot say for sure that this dye will give this color. Therefore, it is important that this particular class of dye needs to be standardized. So, we carried out our own step of standardization. And the usual methods of you know extraction apparatus and the usual uh, methods of analysis by using UV visible spectrophotometer color scan machine for looking at the color depth and uh, the hue color. We all use those particular methods and the, for cotton tannic acid and the modern such as alum, copper, potassium dichromate, stannous chloride. These were the four moderns that we tried to use with hibiscus extract. Of course, hibiscus flowers were collected and they were uh, uh, extracted from there. And the, uh, we also during the process of extraction, we tried to standardize even the process of extraction of the dye. Although this dye is water soluble, but a better extraction in an acidified methanolic solution enhances the color to come into the aqueous medium. There are several methods available in the literature and we have spent lot of time in learning about the extraction procedure, but for anthocyanin dyes 
we have developed a very special technique. People used hy dilute hydrochloric acid and methanol, but you know whenever these harsh uh, acids are used, it always can have a bad impact on the dyeing of uh, delicate and natural fibers like uh, cotton, silk and wool. Therefore, we thought that if citric acid is replaced, uh, it, it, it replaces the hydrochloric acid, it will probably have a better impact and would do the needful because basically it is only the acidified hydrolytic medium that is required for the uh, you know uh, extraction of the anthocyanidine from the anthocyanin and therefore uh, we used methanolic citric acid solution for the extraction of the dye. Now usually the normal methodology is that a pure fabric is taken, it is washed and cotton particularly must go through the tannic acid pretreatment and then mordanting. We chose only four mordants as what I mentioned, we took um, anthos, uh, sorry, alum, copper sulphate, sinus chloride and um, uh, these were the uh, mordants that were used. The extraction of anthocyanin dye was done with uh, citric acid solution in methanol and then the methanol was removed under vacuum so that you know the color is not destroyed. We did not heat too much because uh, overheating such dyes can create a discoloration. We tried to then an analyze the 